Okay, let's get started, folks. I'm Ken Klingenstein. I, uh, I do middleware work for Internet2. Um, I get to live on the frontier. Um, got to do the frontier one other time at, uh, at Internet1. Um, and uh, riding the exponential is always fun. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff. Um, I sure welcome that if you have any questions, barbs, whatever, you just run to the microphone and yell out point of order in, in classic uh, Don Juan fashion and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, take it from there. I'm gonna talk about uh, things identity, um, uh, social, federated, scholarly, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so without any ado, um, gonna begin with a quick social identity um, update. I got one slide, but it's really chewy. Um, and then I'll move into federated identity. I got graphics and the other kinds of stuff. Uh, um, I've been, the, I've been uh, gifted with a NIST grant um, um, over the last uh, few years to do some work with the federal government in this space. Um, I played the White House last week, just uh, not far from here. I believe Darth Vader was in the audience, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the, uh, some, some of the aspects associated with that. Um, we'll go into see, uh, um, some scholarly identity stuff. Um, we've had some conversations in the last few days with ORCID, and I have some actual questions to ask you folks. And then uh, we'll end with um, collaboration platforms, which are the orchestration of ca collaboration tools into an integrated access and identity management framework. And again, interrupt whenever you, you, you'd like. So, social identity update. Um, we all have our Gmail and Yahoo accounts. Um, and in fact, in the US, this stuff is reaching sa saturation. Um, Notice that the uh, focus of service to the consumer continues, but it's really that you are the product that Google wants. Um, and be very clear about that, it's you, and so they will be harvesting all your information, as you well know, and I'll talk a little bit about some of, the, uh, some of those activities um, when we talk about a privacy manager. Um, but, um, um, Interestingly, about three or four years ago when the feds were ramping up an identity initiative, um, Google and Yahoo and Microsoft all lined up to be certified as LOA1 um, for federal applications allowing you to use your Gmail account to check your social security balance, for example, or to book um, campgrounds in the National Park Service. And they went through a process and they all got certified. They're up for a renewal none of them has shown up at the door. Have they given up? Or is the federal government not a particularly attractive relying party? Is it a particularly demanding um, relying party? And so uh, Google wants nothing to do with that. Uh, I don't know the answer, but it is striking that these companies that were lined up are now not lined up. Um, anymore, they're dropping their certifications, or at least they haven't renewed them. Um, and I think it's partially around if you serve federal government sites, you may have to meet federal standards for privacy, and they don't have an interest in doing that. Um, in fact, um, if we're going to infringe on the terms and conditions that Google puts up there or Yahoo puts up there, um, those terms and conditions are their business and they're not about to change those. And um, there's a wonderful movie out there that some of you may have seen on terms and conditions um, that is very compelling. If you haven't seen the movie and you don't have 90 minutes, there's a 30 minute South Park episode, um, which is the distillation, but it's essentially the same activity that, that the character on South Park loses their identity to whoever they've clicked through on that agreement and can't get it back. Um, so this is consumer as a service, not consumer. Um, um, serving the consumer, it's using the consumer. There's a protocol evolution happening underneath OpenID Connect, um, and some of you may know that terminology. Um, there is standards processes that are moving at a fairly slow but steady rate to begin to um, make OpenID Connect as rich as SAML, 
And in doing so, they're making it as complicated as SAML. So if you've been following the Open ID story, it was, oh, nice, nice idea, you SAML uh, federalistas, um, but my God, this is really hard. We can make it simpler. Well, it turns out if you're trying to solve the problems we were trying to solve, you can't make it simpler. And so um, courtesy of uh, our dear departed uh, colleague, um, when we were doing SAML, um, we took six months out in the beginning of the process to make sure that we couldn't make it simpler. And I had coding money, and I'm going, Bob, Bob, we want to code. And uh, after six months, we, were we had convinced ourselves that this is as simple as you could make it and still meet the use cases we were trying to satisfy. Um, so the problem with moving slowly and moving with a complicated, an increasingly complicated standard is that some of those social companies aren't moving along with it. So Facebook has said, my God, what we're doing is good enough. We want our business is not on the authentication process. Our business in, is in harvesting your data. And so uh, it's not going to be the uniform market that we wanted to. Um, and a lot of this is around the OAuth mechanism for non-web-based apps. And basically, phones have changed the name of the game. And I'll come back and talk about that. But for so long, those of us who are purists in the middleware business said, oh my god, we can't put a client on the desktop. How would you begin to maintain that? Along comes telephones, and my god, it's all clients on that little desktop. And so suddenly, we're going to be the same kind of slobs that everybody else are and uh, put clients on the desktop. It's the way, it's the way of the world. Um, the FIDO Alliance is a, um, a, a group of uh, social identity providers that are pr promoting multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is really important. I'll come back to this in a bit. But with the rise of really good phishing, um, the only alternative left is MFA. And we're not going to get away from really good phishing. In fact, it's getting better and better as we speak. Um, notice that in typical identity landscape, there are two things we worry about. Is it really you? And then how is your act of authentication? Well, social IDPs don't even worry about is it really you, just the act of authentication. And, uh, and, and so how do they know that it's really you or the same person coming back each time? I've seen the Google matrix. Over 100 factors go into figuring out if the person sitting at the keyboard someplace is really the same person who was sitting at the keyboard 10 days ago. And so we've all traveled overseas. We've all had little prompts from Google going, hmm, what are you doing in... In, in, in England, and uh, you have to go through one of your security questions, et cetera. That's part of their massive algorithm that they apply in this space. That massive algorithm is harvesting your privacy left and right, not, not the subject of this conversation. Um, but basically, the, ident the relying party is deciding whether or not what they're offering is so risky that they have to worry about um, who, who you are. are. Um, the Yahoo email address Open, uh, issue opened up massive eyes. If you're not familiar, Yahoo decided to recycle email addresses, which means recycling authentication names. Um, and they'll send, if, it, if, if an account's been dormant for six months, um, they'll reassign it. They may send an email note to that dormant account, but this changed everything. For all of us who were gonna say, social identity is a real good bootstrap problem, um, answer to lots of issues, Suddenly, we don't know if it's the same person knocking on the door. And, that, uh, and I, I was with the feds when this got announced. Um, the feds had no influence over getting Yahoo to change their policy. It's all about business for Yahoo. And so it is as it is. And we're left with sweeping up over after the fact that um, norm at gmail.com may in six months be somebody else other than trusty old Norm. So it goes. Um, the NSA revelations are changing international marketplaces. I don't need to say much about that, but there's not a single service provider out there, be it Amazon Web Services, Google, et cetera, that isn't scurrying to figure out how they're going to deal with the NSA blowback. 
Um, typically, they're doing it by setting up um, um, centers in other countries, but as you've uh, probably followed, the lines between the centers in the other countries and Google's massive data center in, in many places in the U.S. are also being tapped. So there is no security there, um, and I don't think U.S. companies can escape this trap. So totally changed everything. Um, thank you, um, Ed. So getting into the uh, uh, federated space, um, we've, been, we've been doing r and &E federations now since about 2003, um, and they've caught on. Um, so worldwide, um, they're now in most places. I'll leave it to the reader to try to figure out what preserving privacy means in China. I don't have an answer to that but there is a Chinese federation. We build these privacy managers. I presume they don't get deployed in some locations. So it goes. In Europe, got 100, almost 100% 100 coverage there. Um, r and &E federations. In some of these countries, it's coverage of the entire population. You can't get welfare in Denmark unless you have a federated account. It's a nice efficiency. They're gonna put the money, your welfare check, into, directly into the bank. So about five or six years ago, there was a solicitation done by the Danish government um, on providing federated identity to all the citizens. Some small company won. The next day, it was bought by a bank. So it goes. But in fact, federated identity has really good traction out there. In common is our own local federation. We've been in business now for about eight or nine years. We've got 400 plus universities. Um, um, over 600 participants. Um, growth is continuing very nicely. Um, we've had the traditional areas um, of collaboration support and access to uh, shared content, etc. cetera. Um, many of you may recall that SHIB was designed one of the key use cases, two of the three use cases were li library focused. Pivotal in what we were doing. Um, there's lots of new services out there, and these new services are echoes of what we hope to promulgate into the world at large. I'll come back and talk about that. Um, and uh, we're certified for government business. There is no whole lot of government business out there at this point, however. Um, there's the growth curve for in common. Um, again, the exponential in the number of service providers. Um, that IDP um, list is going to have a stair step of about 2,000 coming next year when OCLC rolls out software that's going to have um, SHIB IDP baked into it and then every public library that's running that can also be an identity provider inside in common. This graph will become incredibly meaningless in a year or two as we do interfederation and we won't be able to count things the same way. So I'm using the graph while I can because the technology will undermine it if we're good. So U.S. government efforts. Um, there are two efforts um, underway by the U.S. government. Um, the first is FICAM, um, and it's been around for about seven or eight years. It's classic identity services for government. It's growing pretty slowly, but it is growing. Um, it includes the high assurance PIV cards. There may be some um, um, federal employees here who, that have those cards. Thankfully, none of us do. Um, there is PKI, there's federated identity, there's gateways. It's a mix of technologies. Um, it provides the LOA certifications that motivate um, in common assurance programs. Research.gov is accessible through this mechanism, and so I submit my NSF grants using my federated identity um, using this vehicle. Um, NSTIC is the next generation stuff. Um, it's it's uh, next generation services, privacy, et cetera. It has distinct government and pilot efforts. Um, and the scoping is a finesse, a very tricky finesse. So the federal government can only really control access to federal sites. But they want to affect the entire marketplace, including Google. Similarly, the US government is just in the US but they want to affect the entire globe. 
So there's a couple of finesses going on in this space. Um, those finesses um, have um, intermittent success. Um, um, like I said, Google isn't really playing much anymore. Um, uh, Microsoft still, still shows. Um, Yahoo has never been there. Um, I can go through the litany of players out there. But they, uh, they, um, um, it, it's tough leading um, those uh, cats of companies when they um, don't have a whole lot of business motivation to play. Um, about two years ago, the NSTIC effort issued a set of grants. Um, this is the list of grants from the first, year, first round. Um, I want to call attention to two, to, uh, I'll call attention to three grants here. Multi-factor um, um, mul uh, mobile authentication. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you this example only because I can't think of a single use of it, um, which is five-factor authentication. So factor one is username and password. Factor two is an SMS message comes back to my phone and I, uh, I type that, that pin in. Um, factor three is my voice recognition. So there's a secure app on the phone. I speak into the phone. It does a match and says, whoa, we got three-factor authentication. Factor four is I turn the phone around and I take a picture of myself and it does facial recognition. And now we can say, hey, we got four-factor authentication. Do you really need that? Um, and then factor five turns out to be geolocation, um, which is where is this cell phone right now? Is it in a plausible location? I assume there's some very key constituency that needs five-factor authentication. But frankly, protecting wikis does not require five-factor authentication. So um, I want to call attention to the um, STARD um, application up there, the commercial open source ID verification. This one's going to hit you where you live. This is verifying attributes on a per-attribute basis. So today, if I'm a company selling on the web, and I want to know, gee, shipping address, mm, you know, all this information, is it really valid? My only recourse is to go to Experian or one of the Equifax, um, one of the credit card companies, pay about $10 and get a credit report. How about if I could say, somebody just filled out a web form and they did a shipping address. I want to know if this shipping address is plausibly attached to this particular user. And instead of going to Experian for $10, I'm going to go to that market for verification over there. And I'm going to say, companies, bid on who can verify that address. Who's going to bid? Well, US Postal Service will bid. Google's going to bid. Experian, noticing that their business model is about to get destroyed, is now selling per attribute little tapas, as it were, um, versus the whole credit report. Um, just they recognize the business is about to get um, loaded. Um, so I see price points, typical price point about a dollar to verify a postal address. Hey, that's a lot less than that credit report, especially if I'm doing it in the hundreds of thousands. Um, oh, somebody has it for a dollar and a quarter. Will I get better, better verification? We don't know. There's no standards on that verification back end piece. It's just price points. So you as a consumer, a relying party, get to decide, eh, I'll pay a dollar and a quarter and get a stronger binding of address to user. Why is this relevant to us? We're part of this pilot. They want us to sell studentness. Um, is somebody a student? So they can get a discount um, at um, Under Armour. They can get um, uh, software from Microsoft. Lots of places will give so software discounts or freebies based upon being a student. We have the freshest possible data on studentness. So they would like, in common, to, to step up and say, yeah, we'll do a, a studentness service. In common has a tough issue here. We're not doing anything in this process, right? This, that you're being a student is being verified by Chicago. So I'm supposed to pass 75 cents to Orin every week? Sure. Sounds good to Orin. Um, so um, we'll see how this goes, but you know, we're being asked. Now, interestingly, um, um, these companies can join in common and get all the verification they want for free. My guess is that about a third of the assertions being passed in our landscape today are nothing but um, the anonymous person that you're asking about is a student. Um, and so studentness is, is good business today. 
So it's going to be interesting to see how this works as a hybrid model. The last um, item up there, the two stars, is scalable privacy. It's the grant that, that we were awarded, and uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, they just awarded some new grants. Um, and I'm not going to dive into them, but you can see trust frameworks are really important. Um, I'll talk about trust frameworks in a few minutes. Um, but the interesting one in, in, in that list is Privo. It's a miner's trust mark. And so I've been working with Privo, a very interesting company, um, needs to decompose their business model. But COPPA compliance, Child Online Privacy and Protection Act, is very important stuff. It turns out to be fairly global in that um, no other countries have evolved the case law and regulations around this kind of act. So many other countries refer to copper as their benchmark, which is, which is a goodness. Copper is very interesting stuff. It gets revised every couple of years by the Federal Trade Commission. The latest revision is that um, if you're under 13 and you want to go to a chat room, you have to have the option of releasing a non-personally identifiable name. So I'm working with Privo and I'm going, uh, how are we going to do this? You know? Whereas those of us who are middleware geeks go, oh, that's display name. We have an attribute for that already. Just, just give the users the ability to set their display name and they can release that attribute. If you're under 13, you can't put pictures online that are personally identifiable. Um, it's an interesting set of regulations. Um, I like it because it's fairly demanding. I like it because it's a very analogous to what we've been doing in the R&E space, but in a very different quadrant. Um, and they have all the same sets of issues that we have, interesting world. So um, onto the grant that we have, scalable privacy. Um, we picked the PRISM before the federal government began to use PRISM as a code name for a bad thing. And so, uh, whoops. Um, it's a two-plus-year uh, grant to Internet 2 and in common. I tap a lot of the expertise from the campuses that uh, come to CNI. Um, there are several focal points that we're working on. Um, I'll dive into some of those focal points, and there's the website associated with that um, in case you're interested. So what we're trying to deliver, um, we're beginning with um, promotion of two-factor authentication. Good privacy begins with good security. Critical. Um, and if you're not doing MFA, my gosh, you need to be doing MFA. And I'll come back in a second for the leverage between MFA and federated identity. We're doing citizen-centric attributes. Um, I'll just uh, point out that the Department of Energy requires you to specify your citizenship in order to use supercomputers. How is that verified? It's a self-asserted value that you provide for your citizenship. Self-asserted, I think I'm Cambodian today. Um, trusted metadata approaches, um, and um, uh, I'll come back and talk about that. Um, I think the one issue of, um, of, of interest to this crowd would be the next generation privacy manager. So we are, as a community, what I call attribute retentive. Um, we are very parsimonious in what attributes we release from our, our campuses to relying parties. That causes a lot of problems because we're not releasing sufficient attributes for access control. Uh, I'll contrast that with the, uh, the consumer marketplace where, uh, Lord, I'll, I have a slide on that. Um, so we're beginning to do a privacy manager that will put the attribute release in the hands of the end user. And then we're looking at anonymous credentials and I'll come back and talk about that. MFA, um, um, there's just a lot of attack vectors that MFA is the best solution for. Um, a lot of second factor alternatives are now available, um, USB devices, NFC devices, cell phones, et cetera. Um, and we can manage most of these. And then lastly, coupling federated identity and MFA is extremely powerful. So I was at a, a cloud identity summit in um, July with Amazon. And Amazon proudly announced that Amazon Web Services now has multi-factor authentication. So that you can use two factors to log into Amazon. And I said, that's wonderful. I have hundreds of users on my campuses. They already have second factors. Oh, no, no, we're shipping out 
new tokens to everybody. At which point I went, wait, the users, you know, your users of AWS are generally enterprise-centric. They often have second factors. What are you mailing out second? Oh, I know what you're up to, Amazon. You're trying to sell suspenders to hold all of those second factors. And I went over to Amazon's retail site. Um, this is during the presentation. It was really a stupid thing for me to do. 119 pages of suspenders on the Amazon website, several ready-made to hold all of those second factor devices. You don't want that. You want a single second factor and, and federated identity so we can let any relying party know we've had a rigorous two-factor authentication or a five-factor if you want to go that way um, into the space. Um, it's a wonderful leverage. Um, we need to get to um, um, this, um, um, uh, this place. Um, I, I won't mention that the, won't mention. Um, we're doing two efforts here. Um, in this space, we've got about 2 million users now across 40 some odd campuses. Moving the needle, it's important. We're discovering lots of tough issues here. Accessibility support. Accessibility is a major part of our, our, our proposal. How do we make accessible second factors? FERPA issues. So if I'm gonna use Duo and I want my second factor, to be my cell phone. I go to Duo and I give them my cell phone. Whoa, is that FERPA issues? I don't know. We're worrying about that. Cloud authenticators and DDoS attacks. So um, courtesy of MIT, we've discovered that on occasion, um, there are DDoS attacks on your, onto your campus. If you move basic authentication out to the cloud, as several campuses are doing, and then you get a DDoS attack, not only can you not get to the applications out there in the cloud, you can't authenticate anymore for local campus um, applications. Do you really want to give up that vulnerability? So the next time somebody knocks on your door and says, gee, you can get out of the authentication business and go to the cloud, think twice. Um, alternative strategies when multi-factor tokens aren't available. The students on a dig in Tanzania. The doctors in a shielded room. Second fact is not working. What do you do? This turns out to be a real problem with MFA. Not a reason not to do MFA by any means, because there's evil out there, but something to compensate for and build policy around. And we've had a set of campuses now develop compensatory policies in this space. And then lastly, um, returns on investment. Um, we're delivering some important software along the way. I'll just mention this in passing. Um, in case you have a geek back in IT who wants to know when is SHIB going to do MFA well, it does MFA well. Um, when is CAS going to do it? We got it. Um, and then we're doing an open source um, client certificate um, activity. Um, Citizen-centric attribute deliverables. Um, we've built a, um, a, a scheme, uh, schema catalog. Um, we've done some annotation of use cases. We're building a cookbook to serve citizens. Any Rod Serling fans out there? Thank you. Uh, yes, to serve mankind being one of the legendary shows of all time. We're going to be a little bit more benign, I hope, in this process. Um, um, we're doing a lot of stuff with GPII. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and we're doing a privacy manager. If you're not familiar with GPII, get to be familiar with GPII. Global Publicly Inclusive Infrastructure. It's accessibility support done right, um, um, where there's a set of attributes that control the presentation of information to you, and you can do that from any device without configuration. Um, you can do this in ways that are privacy preserving, saying, I'd like the job postings to recognize that I'm colorblind and be displayed in a compensatory fashion, but you don't need to know yet that I'm not ambulatory during the interview process. I want to be able to control that. We can do that. A lot of this stuff is standardized through some ITU schema. Um, I, uh, I, I have those listed up there. Um, and uh, we've got some pilot um, applications going on there. Um, the um, GPII stuff is not only for those with physical disabilities, um, 
but it's moved into um, cognitive disabilities, which comes back to this community, because seemingly content providers are very comfortable providing information in a compensatory fashion for physical disabilities such as colorblindness, name your screen reader. If we ask them to reformat content for cognitive disabilities, because frequently one of the impacts of a cognitive disability is I can't do depth first search. I need the content to be restructured. Publishers seem to balk at that one, and I don't know why, but we're having a tough time convincing them to refactor content. Even as this group that's doing this um, out of uh, Toronto and out of uh, the University of uh, Wisconsin and a few other places are building tools to automatically refactor the content for different kinds of, of compensatory aids. But look at this stuff. I believe it's the future of accessibility. Um, so we're going to continue to work in this. So here's the slide. We're running a social to SAML gateway. We're getting to see what social identity sites release to us. And what we're discovering is that it's promiscuous. My God, they release a lot of attributes. I don't need those attributes. I don't want to know those attributes, but they just release them. It's arbitrary. They change what they're going to release on the basis of, uh, I don't know, what uh, Maurice's uh, uh, mood is that morning kind of thing. But Yahoo will change what attributes they're going to release. Um, and now, as I mentioned with Yahoo, the attributes may not even have any persistent value. That, that makes it really tricky. Um, name is a really difficult field. Stay tuned to this. The federal government is about to mandate legal names in order to make their online services work. By the way, if you don't know, one of the 15 problems um, uh, healthcare.gov um, had in opening up its doors was that they did a really stupid SAML configuration for the audience field. And so all kinds of commercial SAML software broke. The only software that worked, it turned out, was SHIB for that particular field. But it was a stupid decision on their part. So the stuff's in deployment and you get the, the... So the federal government needs to know your name. How's it going to find your name? How's it going to believe that name? But they really want to know your name for online transactions. Um, and so they've come to us and they say, well, how are you going to solve this problem? Um, that's an international set of issues. Um, one of our um, uh, prime examples is what we call the Spanish surname problem. How do I pack those five Spanish surnames that um, people of Spanish descent may have into first name, last name boxes? Well, it turns out that that's very country dependent. So how am I going to solve this globally? Um, in terms of that packing problem. Interesting stuff. Um, we're going to be doing some usability. Let me get on to the privacy manager. Here's the privacy manager work. It's being done by the Center for Usable Privacy and Security at Carnegie Mellon, best in the biz. Um, um, it's going to help man users manage um, the release of attributes. Um, and um, we have excellent research that shows that over 90% of the users of social sites do not know what attributes are being released or how to control them. When I spoke to the researchers at Carnegie Mellon a couple of months ago and I said, by the way, I need a speaker from, uh, I'm gonna be out in Silicon Valley, I need a speaker in usability, um, where should I get one? They said, go to Google. And I said, but didn't your research show that 90% of those users of Google don't know how to use it? And the answer was, yeah, those people are really good. So Google's business model is, is to make sure you don't know how to manage your attribute release. No offense to Google, it's their business. So we're going through some key design considerations. Perhaps the hardest part in this issue is informed consent. It's not enough to do consent. And if you look at it, like the Google release page for attributes, it's all or nothing. And there's no information about what these fields are or what the values of those fields are. Um, compare that to this screen, which is what the Carnegie Mellon people have, de ha have developed. A couple of things to note. Um, pretty clear on what's being released. The value of what's being released is displayed. So you can say, hey, that's not right, and maybe correct it. Um, and it's granular, controls over each attribute. And perhaps most importantly is that little blue eye dot, which is tell me more. 
It's the informed consent button. Where can informed consent go? Well, it can go and reach into the SAML metadata from the Federation and say, this is a research and scholarship application. We've vetted it. It's asking for the minimum set of attributes it needs. We've made sure they dispose of those attributes properly. Go forth, release, and prosper. That same I button can go to a reputation system. What do my friends release to this site? It can go to an institutional repository that says, your university recommends that you release these attributes. So that little I button is a door into a whole lot of informed consent in the background. Very different than the experiences you have on Google and Yahoo. Um, this is kind of the information that can pop up um, in that process about um, the uh, site that you're visiting. And uh, it has some implications about um, metadata um, that we're passing around in the Federation. Um, and uh, I won't go into this for the interest of time. Enough stuff. One thing that we're starting to do here is roll this out to campuses. And so a few of the campuses in this room, I'm talking to you, Oren, I'm talking to you, the University of Washington, and a few other places, we're going to be asking to participate in something about deploying this. Right now, we're calling this Lifestyles of the Attribute Rich and Privacy Preserved. It's a felicitous name, LARP. Um, but um, uh, um, what we're trying to do is get privacy managers into the hands of end users. We're trying to get some normalization of attributes out there. Um, and uh, we're trying to look at some uh, um, uh, anonymous credential use and uh, international privacy laws. So for those of you who have international campuses, you're befuddled about, oh my god, whose attribute release policy applies when the students from uh, Dubai, um, the websites in the US, and uh, the identity provider is the University of Chicago. Um, so those international privacy laws are getting very confounding. We're going to step into that um, swamp. Um, so um, along the way, um, one of the things the NSTIC process decided to do was to sell trust marks. It needs a business model. The federal government uh, funding for this runs out in six months. It was a two-year grant. So what are they going to do? They're going to sell trust marks. Do you know what a trust mark is, federal government? Oh, probably not, but we can sell a lot of them. And so out of that experience, I, uh, I, I built a uh, periodic table of trust elements. And the website has the, um, has the um, periodic table um, in it, and um, um, out of that, we build trust marks, and those trust marks are of importance in the world, um, and uh, we're doing a minus trust mark and a few others. Enough said on that. Um, so where's the puck going? If we're successful, this shouldn't be federation in two years. This should just be interfederation, just as there is the internet. So the steady state here is interfederated identity, and that's why the chart I talked about earlier of growth is going to become vacuous because um, we're not going to have a crisply defined federation. We should have a large mass of community doing consistent approaches to uh, federated identity. Um, we need to do federation, interfederation across uh, countries. All those countries that I showed on the earlier map of r &E federations want to work together. How are we going to make that happen? We're going to do interfederation between sectors. K-12 federation is starting to run in this country. Very exciting work. How does that relate to in common? Um, uh, healthcare, et cetera. Doctors are a thrill. You know that. But a doctor can belong to a hospital and have a hospital identity and then walk across the street to the medical school with the same damn device now that's supposed to be tethered to both locations and uh, both, uh, both models. We need to make that into federation work. Um, we're, um, we're doing the technologies now to make this work. Those are relatively straightforward. For those of you who go back to the early days of the internet, we used to do Etsy hosts for all of the machines on the internet when we could list them all. And then we had to move to DNS. We're doing the same thing with metadata. Nice work underway, um, internationally done. Policy issues, well, this is going to be trickier. And for example, 
right now, Europe has drafted a policy that says if a user located, let's say, in Spain is using a site at the University of Chicago and the University of Chicago spills attributes that the user is given on the floor and the user wants relief, they will be able to sue in Spain. So I hope the University of Chicago has lots of lawyers well versed on the laws of Spain, Belgium, France, Japan, etc. It's a difficult task. And so one of the things we're trying to do is modify this code of conduct. Um, much as safe harbor handles lots of international issues uh, accordingly. So the social to Samuel gateway. Um, again, we're doing big business in this space right now. If you have a, uh, if you're, let's say, Carnegie Mellon University, and you want parents to be able to look at the bills of their student, how can they do that? Well, you can give the parents accounts. Oh my God, you don't want to do that. Accounts are enough of a hell as it is. You could ask the student to loan the parents their account. Neither you nor the student wants to do that. Or you can say, parents, use your Google account and come in through the gateway. And that's what many universities are doing. In, it, uh, again, um, uh, we're doing this. Um, um, it's very handy for extended populations. It's showing lots of issues. I talked about the coarse grain research uh, release. I talked about the promiscuous attribute release. Um, um, what's in the name, LOA mapping, lots of hard issues, we're working through them. Scholarly identity, all in two minutes. Um, so uh, we're doing um, um, lots of um, um, categorization to get the right attributes to be released by campuses to scholarly sites. There's a wonderful activity called CI Logon out of Argonne Labs that converts um, uh, regular federated identities into certificates for use in the grids. And then finally, we're starting conversations with ORCID about putting the ORCID identifier into EduPerson. And we had a great call with Jeff Builder and Laura um, earlier this week. Lots of interesting issues came out of it. Um, and they don't seem to have made the slide deck, which is kind of okay. Um, last thing is um, collaboration platforms. Um, it's not about identity. Having just talked about it for 48 minutes, it's not about identity. It's about access control. We're building access control federations. That's really the business. I don't want to know your identity unless I have to. Um, but identity is not privacy preserving, et cetera. So um, we're really into attributes and access control. Um, and we're building collaboration platforms that take all of your favorite tools and domesticate them to a consistent open standards approach to um, access control. Um, um, we're trying to leverage, we will leverage your federated identity, but we'll also give you the ability, ability to create attributes. Um, um, we're gonna stick every possible application we can think of into this um, regime. Um, and uh, this is being done in many other countries along the way. And what it looks like is a model like this. So you as a federated user, just use your federated identity to get to all of those applications in red and hundreds more that are domesticated. And maybe you'll get in because of the identity. Maybe you'll get in because of your group membership. Maybe you'll get in because the right attribute was released that said you're a citizen of so-and-so or you're a student enrolled in a certain course. Um, um, but all of that stuff will work for the access control. And then you might be the czar of the collaboration. So you want to determine which groups can access this instrument or reset this instrument. So then you take that blue line and you come around and use standard normative open tools um, that we've developed over the last few years to do group memberships, create groups, put groups within groups, et cetera, take people out of groups. Um, and then all of that group stuff is used to do the access control for the, all the applications sitting in the red. So takeaways. Um, moving the needle on MFA, really important work. Um, attributes are the key, and it's already a mess. 
um, watching what goes through the, the, um, the social disarmament gateway, what Yahoo thinks your name is. Whoa, that's not really your name, is it? Um, uh, the same with phone numbers, lots of, lots of stuff out there. We're researching what it takes to put informed into consent and trying to deploy it. Um, I didn't cover anonymous credentials much, but it's interesting stuff. Um, it's a technology that's been out there for a while, and it gives us one of the standards that the federal government holds us to, which is unobservability. So if I'm dealing with classic federated identity, I can protect your identity. Um, as an IDP. I can just release attributes, I can release opaque identifiers, but I know what you're doing. I'm releasing attributes. The only technology that gives me unobservability so that not even the IDP knows is these anonymous credentials. How might they be used in our community? One very interesting idea is that you get an e-diploma, which is an anonymous credential. And then if someplace wants to know whether or not you graduated Brown, they can query the credential, they get back a yes, no answer, are you a graduate of Brown? Um, and Brown doesn't know who asked. Brown wasn't involved in the transaction. Interesting. That's what we're trying to do. Social identity has its virtues and its perils. Collaboration platforms are the access management part of IAM, and they're coming along. Um, and lastly, the, um, you know, we're, gonna, we're moving towards uh, interfederated identity and I can handle questions. Thanks a lot.